Hello, everyone, and welcome, at least virtually, to the Wilson Center. And I'm really pleased to join you for this timely and important discussion. We'll be touching briefly on a series of pressing issues that the Biden administration will need to consider as it further develops its domestic and foreign policy priorities. These are issues that may not be on the front page every day, but they are issues that will increasingly shape important relationship and important interests in the years ahead. As the former administrator of USAID, I worked each day with a talented team of professionals to address global issues related to the environment and sound resource management. So I appreciate the vital importance of bringing clear-eyed objective research to policy formulation. I understand the inherent value in and need for robust international partnerships. The many issues at play on Antarctica's vast territorial landscape and in the Southern Ocean require broad-based international cooperation, as well as informed, active, and an enduring role for the United States. Make no mistake, Antarctica has many important policy implications for the US and many important decisions to be made. So as the new administration begins to ramp up its policy development, this meeting today is especially timely. Today, we take up the simple yet profound question, what should the administration's priorities be when it comes to environmental protection in Antarctica? As many of you know, the United States has the largest presence in Antarctica of any country. It is the most scientists and personnel there. It has three all-year research stations there, including the only station at the geographic South Pole. And the US runs the largest research station on the continent, McMurdo Research Station. Antarctica is also a fundamentally important region for understanding the phenomenon of climate change. That's just another reason why the US is a leader in Antarctic Treaty Diplomatic Forum, helping ensure that the region remains a natural reserve devoted to peace and to science. As the Antarctic Treaty System marks the 30th anniversary of the signing of a landmark environmental protocol to the Antarctic Treaty, today's panel will focus on how the US can contribute to environmental protection in Antarctica. In particular, we'll hear how we can enhance marine protection through such tools as new marine protected areas. There's a lot to talk about and a lot to do. Our discussion today will touch on key challenges facing the Antarctic environment to include sustainable fishing, marine conservation, human impacts from tourism and operation of science stations, and more. I'm proud that the Wilson Center is the only think tank in Washington, D.C. that has an institute devoted to the many research and public policy issues unfolding in the Arctic and Antarctic. And the Polar Institute's new strategic plan includes a more robust and comprehensive set of initiatives focused on Antarctica and the Southern Ocean. Underscoring the importance of Antarctica is the extraordinary group of speakers that we have with us here today. I want to thank all of them for sharing their expertise and their time. Now, I have the pleasure of introducing our keynote speaker, U.S. Senator Sheldon Whitehouse. Senator Whitehouse is well known for his leadership on oceans conservation and environmental protection as a member of the U.S. Senate. He is the founder and co-chair of the Congressional Oceans Caucus, which is where I got to work with him more closely. He has worked across the aisle on many environmental protection issues, including his work with Senators Dan Sullivan and Chairman Bob Menendez and Representatives Suzanne Bonamici and Don Young to pass the Save Our Oceans Act 2.0. Observers have rightly called the Save Our Seas Act, I should call it, the most important and comprehensive legislation ever passed by Congress to address the pl plastics debris crisis that's threatening coastal ecosystems and communities, as well, of course, as affecting human, or human life, but more importantly, marine life. Senator Whitehouse has a particular interest in the future of the Antarctic region. I share his interest, as do the members of the Polar Institute. So again, Senator Whitehouse, 
please consider the Wilson Center at your disposal to help inform and influence U.S. policies related to this vast, beautiful, and most consequential region. It's important to you and it's important to us. Welcome and it's good to see you. Thank you, Mark. It's good to see you, Ambassador, I should say. We or should be formal on Zoom, I suppose. Um, I have enjoyed our work together with the McCain Institute, and I've admired your work defending USAID from the plunderers and hooligans. And uh, so thank you for, for all of that. And I think your role in the uh, Wilson Center is gonna be really um, impactful. So I'm really looking forward to working with you. Um, I would say there are a couple of key points that are should be our bellwethers. Um, as the Arctic undergoes its transformation. The first is to protect it as an ecosystem. And I think perhaps the best measure of whether we're protecting it as an ecosystem is uh, protecting the indigenous ways of life that have been pursued in the Arctic um, for time immemorial. And if we use that as a benchmark, um, that will probably be a pretty, pretty good guide. Clearly sustainable fishing is gonna be a very important part of it as fisheries retreat to the north, uh, away from warming waters, uh, they'll become an easier target. And because so much of this uh, area has been protected by inhospitable conditions and ice for so long, it doesn't have the kind of robust enforcement that we need in order to protect it. So really significant protected areas, really significant international agreements about fisheries are going to be, I think, important. And when I say fisheries, you got to go right down to the pteropods because if you kick out the little creatures that are at the bottom of the ocean food chain, it's a very short time until that collapse takes down the more um, human sense sensitive, uh, what do you call it, charismatic uh, megafauna. Um, so that would be really important in order to do that. We've got to really upgrade our scientific effort. Um, things are happening faster in the Arctic than anywhere else. So that means more science has to go there to try to figure out what it means. And we really, I think, have to flood the zone. So an enormous commitment of science, I think, is very important. Um, from a diplomatic point of view, these youth conflicts, which are the hallmark of climate change, risk creating real international conflicts. And so we've got to work on using the various mechanisms that we have to foment peaceful, orderly, responsible uh, resolution of international conflict in this space. And the last thing I'll say, those would be the top three things, but this is kind of a personal um, crusade of mine. Focusing on the Arctic brings into stark relief how rapidly climate change is overwhelming us. And it causes us or should cause us to think more carefully about why it is that we're not acting responsibly through governments to take on this crisis. And that should in turn focus on the apparatus that the fossil fuel industry has built and funded and utilized for decades. But in the US, particularly aggressively in the last decade to block climate action. This is not something that happens because we don't know. This is not something that happens because of partisanship. This is not something that happens because of you know, alien forces. Um, this is something that is happening because a very powerful industry is using very sneaky and unfortunate means to block the solution that will help us get through this. And so we can talk about all these other things, but at the core of the problem, is the fossil fuel industry's continued antagonism to climate progress, particularly in the US and particularly in Congress. So I'll leave it at that. And um, this is the place where we really need to show what we can do. It's the early indicator. And if we're failing in the Arctic, it's a pretty good sign that we're gonna fail everywhere. So it's really important to step up and make sure we're not failing in the Arctic. And that will show that we have the capacity to not fail around the rest of the globe. Senator Whitehouse, this is this is Mike Sprague. Thank you so much for, for your comments, your opening comments here today. Uh, you, you've raised, I have some questions for you if you, you won't mind taking a sure. few more minutes, is that right? Oh, okay, yeah. wonderful. 
Uh, you, you raised a number of issues here, which you have raised at the Wilson Center before and other, other fora that you have spoken at. <clears throat> and there's been some consistent themes. One has been, of course, the protection of the oceans. Two has been sort of our own, our own governance, international governance, but our own domestic lens through which we see these environments and linking the Arctic to the Antarctic and to the global oceans. So I wonder if I, I couldn't ask you uh, maybe to think, to, to share with us your thoughts about US uh, domestic and foreign policy as it relates to the Arctic and, and the importance of research and science and having science drive policy for both the Arctic region and the Antarctic region, two regions that really require, in my opinion, a whole lot more research to inform the policies at both poles through a US perspective. So if you don't mind me like buzzing up to like 20,000 feet. Please. The um, United States has long been a force for good in the world uh, because of the principles that we follow, principles of democracy, principles of transparency, principles of reliance on science. Um, and we've been sort of the alternative theory to autocracy and kleptocracy and communism and other uh, less successful um, means of governance. And we've challenged our role in the last four years under President Trump, but I think President Biden and this administration are eager to rebuild that role. But in order to rebuild that role, it's not enough to talk the talk. You actually have to go out there and perform. And that means we've got to show that we'll support the science. It means we've got to invest in the science, particularly where things are happening so fast. I describe science as society's headlights. That's how you know what's coming at you. And the speed at which the future is coming at us in the Arctic is far faster than in most other places. So we need particularly good headlights. We need the halogen high beams. We need to see what is coming at us. So that's a really big thing. But the other thing is, if we're going to set an example, there are a lot of theories of governance around in the world right now. The American theory of governance is not the only one. And if we want ours to stand out as the good one, We've got to live that too. And the world is going to know for a long time that America walked away from action on climate change because it allowed its government to be corrupted by the fossil fuel industry. And that's just a blemish that we're going to have to live with. There's no way to undo the facts. But the sooner we can reverse them and the sooner we can get back to a Congress that operates based on facts and policy and good judgment and protecting the general welfare rather than the power of a special interest, the better our American example will be. And I, as the son, grandson, and nephew of foreign service officers, feel very, very deeply the pain that we've experienced and the world has experienced as America has walked away from its role as an exemplar of democracy. We're coming back, but we gotta come back real, and we gotta come back hard. Thank you, Senator. And if, if if you <clears throat> indulge me one more question before, before we let you go. Uh, we have often spoken about the policy, the policies that, that drive, I, I, I love the society, where society research and science or society's headlights. Uh, you, you, got, you got to buy the headlights, put them on, uh, pay for the headlights. You have to have the policy and the energy behind them, right? The, the, the investments yeah. behind them. So th the question is investing in research. How do we invest in research? We, got, we have a lot of demands on us, infrastructure, COVID, the economy, uh, the, the investment in research. Where do you see that coming up in the next four years so that we can actually shine those lights you talked about on the policy issues coming at us? Well, I think scientists like Enric and Sylvia would probably have a better idea on that. But clearly, um, we are in a mode in the US Congress of making significant investments and science needs to be a part of those significant investments. Fortunately, science has been very supported even through the dark years. It was strong bipartisan support for our national institutes, for our national laboratories, for the programs that fund our state universities, for NOAA and other programs. So um, I think that the willingness is there. It's just a question of stepping up to this new Arctic challenge and making sure that we focus our science, our headlights on what's coming at us in the Arctic so that we can uh, both understand that and solve the problem, but also test ourselves as to our ability to be a problem solving species before the problem gets ahead of us. 
Well, thank you very much. I know you, you've taken time out of your schedule to be with us today. You have limited time, but I want to thank you. Every, every time we ask for your time, sir, you, you provide that time to us and you make us better each time. So thank you very well, much for my that. And you, pleasure you, to be invited you, and included. So thank you. Well, it, it won't be the last time, Senator. Thank you so very much. And you've set the groundwork here for our colleagues. I want to thank you very, very much for taking time with us today. All right. Thank you, sir. We'll now uh, continue on with our, our program. And I want to th thank uh, Mark Green, Ambassador Green, for jumping in and starting off the discussion today. Just as we were beginning, my internet dropped. So, uh, Mark, thank you very much for for jumping in, starting off the program as our new president, CEO, and director of the Woodrow Wilson Center. I now have the pleasure of introducing my good friend and colleague, Evan Bloom, who will now introduce the panelists and begin our discussion. Evan joined the Wilson Center as a senior fellow in January of 2021. Uh, he was until recently one of the US government's foremost experts on the Arctic and Antarctic governance and foreign policy, as well as oceans policy. And during his nearly 30 years at the State Department, he served as Acting Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Oceans and Fisheries and Director of the o Office of Ocean and Polar Affairs. Uh, many, many components of Evans' career. In particular, he led the U.S. Antarctic Policy as head of the U.S. delegation to the annual Antarctic Treaty Consultative Meetings and the Commission for Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources from 2006 to 2020. He also served as the lead U.S. negotiator for the successful establishment of the world's largest marine protected area in Antarctica's Ross Sea. Evan, I want to thank you very much for putting together a wonderful program and putting together an incredible panel of experts. I will turn this program over to you. Mike, thank you very much uh, indeed. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be uh, part of this discussion uh, regarding current issues in Antarctic environmental protection. Um, we have a truly amazing group of panelists today and I uh, greatly appreciate the, the views just offered by Senator Whitehouse. Um, uh, Antarctic issues get less attention in the US than Arctic ones and that's uh, perhaps understandable given that the US is an Arctic state and is located in the Northern Hemisphere. But the relationship between the United States and the Antarctic is longstanding as Ambassador Green pointed out. And in these days when the issue uh, of climate change has become a central concern of US and other governments, uh, environmental protection is an important international topic. Um, it really does uh, help to keep in mind that Antarctica is enormous. The continent is one and a half times the size of the continental United States. The world's largest marine protected area, which was established in Antar Antarctica's Ross Sea in 2016, as you mentioned, Mike, is twice the size of the state of Texas. The area to which the Antarctic Treaty System applies includes around 10% of the Earth's oceans and the entire area including the continent covers almost 50 million square kilometers. Environmental protection issues in Antarctica relate to both terrestrial and marine areas. Our guests today have particular expertise on the marine issues. And indeed the question of marine protected areas may be the most politically charged current issue in Antarctic diplomacy. There are three major proposals for marine protected areas now before the Commission for the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources, and I'm sure we'll be discussing those. In addition, there are issues and concerns relating to promoting sustainable fishing and fighting illegal, unregulated, and unreported fishing. And there are many important environmental issues in Antarctica that don't relate to fish. It is now the 30th anniversary of the signing of the Protocol on Environmental Protection to the Antarctic Treaty. The cornerstone of the treaty system since the protocol came into force has been the ban on mining. And while all governments active in Antarctica are bound by that ban and none speak against it, the strength of the long-term commitment to that key provision of Antarctic governance is something that is worth keeping an eye on. Moreover, in order to promote environmental protection, the Antarctic Treaty parties reached agreement in 2005 
on an annex on liability related to environmental impacts. The United States needs to ratify that annex sent to the Senate by President Obama for it to enter into force. Into force. Surely that is something that the Biden administration, administration will wish to consider. I assume we'll talk about the importance of the Southern Ocean in relation to climate change. I should mention that a week, a week ago, the Wilson Center and the Pew Charitable Trust convened a meeting of scientists to talk about that issue. It was a very productive session, and I know that Dr. Earl, Earl who per participated in the workshop, will be speaking to its conclusions. So we'll now hear from our panelists and following, following that, we will have an opportunity for questions and answers. So if you have a question, please send it via email to polar at wilsoncenter.org. And I guess you can also tweet to at Polar Institute. The questions will be collated and sent to me so I can pose at least some of them. Uh, Michaela Sith of the Polar Institute is collating them and she did all the administrative work to put on this event. So I do want her th to thank her for all her work in that, in that regard. So now I'd like to uh, introduce Virginis Karajus, uh, the Commissioner for the Environment, Oceans and Fisheries at the European Commission. He was Lithuania's Minister of Economy from 2017 to 2019. And before that, he led the Committee of Economy of the Parliament of Lithuania. Uh, Mr. Sinkarajus was elected to the Parliament in October 2016. Commissioner, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. First of all, of course, thank you very much for inviting me and, and, and for giving me an opportunity to exchange with you on a very important and uh, timely topic. I would start from uh, the very beginning. I would say that the arrival of the new Biden administration is an excellent opportunity to take stock of efforts uh, to protect Antarctica's fragile environment, in particular, its marine life, and, and to explore how the United States can contribute to this important objective. This is a very, very timely discussion because there is no time to lose. Over the past 30 years, Antarctica has warmed by 1.8 degrees Celsius, and which is three times more than the global average. So climate change is already having a profound and, and, and potentially irreversible impacts on Antarctica and its uh, marine life. Antarctica holds 90% of the world's ice and, and has shown at least a six-fold increase in ice loss over the period of 1994 uh, 20, uh, 2012, and we know that large-scale marine protected areas can help uh, conserve marine biodiversity, maintain ecosystems, and, and build ocean resilience against such impacts. The Commission for the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources, Kamala, has long been a, a, a leader on the issue of MPAs. Already in 2009, the members of Kamala including the EU and, and, and the USA, agreed to establish a representative system of MPAs in the Southern Ocean by 2012. It's sobering that nine years later, Kamala has still not been able to deliver on its commitment. And in addition, at, at global level, the international community has agreed to the UN Sustainable Development Goals, under which uh, we should conserve at least 10% of coastal and marine areas through MPAs by 2020. And currently MPAs cover only 7.5% of seas and oceans, which is still significantly below that target. Achieving this target is the responsibility of the entire international community. The waters of the Southern Ocean uh, provide an opportunity to make uh, true uh, on our promises and to reach our commonly agreed targets. But it will also help us get closer to the 30% target that we now hope to see re recognized at the upcoming COP15 and that the scientific community considers as a very minimum. Uh, but uh, let me return to that later on. The protection of, of, of the Antarctica's unique marine biodiversity and, and, and fragile ecosystem is, is a priority for the European Union and, of course, its member states. 
and the designation of new Antarctic MPAs is a key deliverable of the EU's biodiversity strategy for 2030, adopted in May last year. And in her first State of the Union address in last September, Commission President Ursula von der Leyen committed to using the EU's diplomatic strength and the economic clout to broker agreement on MPAs in the Antarctica. And the EU and its member states have proposed to establish two new large-scale MPAs in Antarctica, one in the East Antarctica and another in the Weddell Sea. Australia, Norway, Uruguay, and the UK co-sponsor these proposals, as we hope others, of course, will join. If approved, they would make an essential contribution to achieving a representative system of, of MPAs in Antarctica uh, by protecting an area of more than uh, 3,000 million square, meter, uh, square kilometers. And the proposal from Argentina and Chile to create an MPA in the Antarctic Peninsula covers uh, circa of only 0 0.65 million kilometers. Uh, uh, so together, these three proposals would protect about 1% of the world's ocean. And this would constitute a historic act of environmental protection. Unfortunately, China and Russia continue to block the adoption of our MPA proposals over concerns that they may affect their fisheries interest. Uh, and this was again uh, the case at the latest Kamala annual meeting in October 2020. And although we are disappointed that, that Kamala was once again unable to reach agreement on our proposals on that occasion, we are heartened by the broad support received uh, from other members uh, for our proposal, including, of course, from the United States, which uh, participated in a joint statement on MPA coordinated uh, by the EU with past and, and present proponents. And the, USA, uh, uh, the US has been a, a, a longstanding and, 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 and staunch supporter of Antarctic MPAs. Without its leadership, Kamala would not have been able to adopt the Ross Sea uh, region MPA in 2016. It was adopted only after outreach efforts by the USA at the highest level, of course, by the President Obama, but a huge job uh, was done also by Secretary of State, uh, State John Kerry outreaching to China, to, 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 to Russia directly. The lesson we in the EU have learned from, from the adoption of the Ross Sea MPA is that high political engagement is crucial. It's essential to overcome resistance from reluctant members. Unfortunately, our outreach efforts to China and Russia have not yielded uh, any tangible results so far. Of course, we will continue to systematically raise our MPA proposals in our high level contacts with China and Russia. In parallel, we are trying to get a dialogue going at technical level to see how we can address their concerns about our proposal. Having said that, there are a number of ways in which the US could support our MPA efforts. First, the US could become a co-sponsor of our MPA proposal. Uh, we have invited the Biden administration to consider this option and to participate in a dedicated web ministerial meeting on Antarctic MPAs with current co-sponsors and potential new co-sponsors that I will be hosting on 28th of April uh, this year. Uh, increasing the official co-sponsorship of our proposals would, of course, raise, first of all, visibility and put additional uh, pressure on, 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 on their opponents. Secondly, the Biden administration could raise the designation of new Antarctic MPAs in its meetings with Chinese and Russian uh, stakeholders and use its di diplomatic uh, cloud to keep this issue high on the international agenda. And we will have a, a, a bigger impact. Uh, if we all speak, uh, of course, with one voice. And I therefore look forward to joining forces with the US to drive forward the designation of new MPAs by Kamala. Still this year, uh, the designation of these MPAs in 2021 would be a fitting way to mark the 40th anniversary of Kamala and the 30th anniversary of the uh, uh, Madrid Protocol. To end, uh, I have so far focused my intervention on how we can protect Antarctica's marine environment by taking action in Antarctica. Uh, but of course, that would be telling only half the story if we were to stop there. 
many of the environmental problems that are occurring in Antarctica are brought from outside. And uh, the same is true for, of course, Arctic. And let me therefore briefly uh, zoom out to the global level and say a few words about what we can and need to do outside Antarctica. And the first and most pressing issue is the fight against climate change. And it's crucial that we succeed in, lim in limiting uh, global warming well below two degrees Celsius compared to pre-industrial levels. And we therefore welcome President Biden's decision to return the US uh, to the Paris Agreement. Uh, the EU is fighting climate change through ambitious policies at home and in close cooperation with international partners. At home, we are on track to meet our greenhouse gas emissions reduction targets and have put forward a plan to further uh, cut emissions by at least 55% by 2030. And our aim, of course, is to become climate neutral by 2050. At international level, we will continue to lead international negotiations to increase the ambition of major emitters ahead of the UN uh, climate change conference in Glasgow later this year. It's you know about COP26. And if we want to tackle climate change comprehensively, we also need to address resource extraction and processing, which accounts for around 50% of greenhouse uh, gas emissions. And in making the transition to a circular economy, we can curb this often forgotten 50%. At the same time, we see circular economy as a triple win policy, generating net saving for business, um, creating jobs and of course, lowering environmental impacts. In the same way, we are also pushing hard to combat plastic pollution. We see a major gap in the current legal and, and the policy framework. And, and, and we are looking to secure a, a global plastics agreement to fill this gap. This along with our efforts to tackle marine litter um, can have a extremely positive effect of, uh, on Antarctica. So climate change is also inter, uh, is also linked with biodiversity degradation and, and climate change uh, accelerates the destruction of, of natural world. And in turn, uh, biodiversity loss is a key driver of climate change. So however, on the positive side, biodiversity can also significantly contribute to regulating climate change. And we cannot make progress on climate without addressing biodiversity and ecosystem loss and vice versa. So within the EU, our EU biodiversity strategy aims to reverse the degradation of ecosystems and to put Europe's biodiversity on a path to recovery by 2030 as part of this strategy. And we're aiming, of course, to increase uh, our EU network of MPAs and other effective conservation measures to 30% by 2030. And we even uh, ambition that at least one third of these protected areas representing 10% of the EU seas should be uh, strictly protected. So I'll stop here. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I was glad to contribute. Uh, I'm looking forward for a, a, a fruitful uh, discussion. Commissioner, thank you very much uh, for those detailed uh, comments. I think everyone greatly appreciates that you've been very specific about uh, what you think the uh, Biden administration can do uh, concretely in this area. Um, you also uh, linked the Antarctic discussion to the more general question of uh, targets for MPAs globally and oceans po policy generally. So thank you very much. That's extremely helpful. Um, so now uh, what I'd like to do is uh, introduce uh, Helen Agren. She is the ambassador for the ocean at the Swedish Ministry for Foreign Affairs. She has uh, extensive experience working on sustainable development through the UN and many other organizations. She's been a leader on advancing sustainable development goal 14 on oceans. Uh, and I should mention that Sweden now uh, chairs uh, CAMELAR, the Southern Ocean uh, Fisheries Commission. So uh, Ambassador Algren, uh, the floor is, is yours. Hello, everyone, and thank you very much, uh, Evan, uh, for that introduction. And thank you for inviting me and giving me the possibility to discuss this important issue of Antarctica and the Southern Ocean. Uh, I feel really humbled to uh, be part of this uh, distinguished panel uh, and uh, look forward to our discussion. Uh, the Southern Ocean is an extraordinary ocean. It is key to understanding how our, how our world works and our impact upon it. 
Antarctica plays an, uh, a crucial role in the protection of our planet, our ocean and the marine life. And it's important for science because it's profound effect on the Earth's climate and ocean system. Enshrined in its four kilometer thick cover of ice is a unique record of the climate of the past one million years. So climate change poses the greatest, greatest threat uh, to the ocean and in combination with overexploitation, pollution and eutrophication, the marine environment, its biodiversity and the very functioning of the ecosystems are at peril. Antarctica shall continue forever to be exclusively used for peaceful purposes, firmly, firmly laid out in the Antarctic Treaty. Science and international cooperation for science purposes is at the backbone of the Antarctic Treaty regime. The regime today comprises a system of international agreements with rules, principles, recommendations, decisions and measures for the protection and preservation of Antarctica. And CAMELAR is an uh, integral part of this regime. The participating states, organizations and individuals were very innovative when they already in the 1970s agreed on conservation measures and pioneered the concept of ecosystem-based management and laid the foundation for CAMELAR. And the collective action in the Antarctic Treaty regime is vital for the whole uh, of the Antarctic ecosystem. And it's been demonstrated over the years that the members of the CAMLAR are capable of sustainably managed marine resources and protecting marine biodiversity in Antarctica. Uh, notably, CAMLAR has operationalized an ecosystem approach to support the sustainable use of marine living resources. And even though many initiatives are in place to conserve and sustainably use marine living resources, there are no shortages of challenges, most notably from climate change and unsustainable exploitation like uh, IUU. Uh, CAMLAR has been a model for constructive multilateral conservation cooperation. And now there's a need to restore and improve the spirit of constructive cooperation to ensure that CAMLAR remains such a model. And we are willing to do our share also as the current share of CAMLAR to improve and build on the CAMLAR structure. And we will ensure to uh, the respect of international law and science-based decision-making and bring it to the forefront of our uh, chairmanship. Of particular importance uh, is to strengthen cooperation on climate change and its impact on the marine ecosystems and to deploy area-based management tools as uh, a respected ecosystem-based conservation measure and also to combat marine debris and IUU and to support digitalization and sharing uh, of data and science. As uh, uh, Commissioner uh, Sinkiewicz just said, uh, the EU has engaged in substantive outreach to Commission members uh, to try to progress Southern Ocean conservation. And as current uh, CAMLAR chair, Sweden is committed to create the space for substantive dialogue between CAMLAR members. And we would welcome the US to join efforts in strengthening uh, Southern Ocean conservation and climate action by engaging diplomatically at high levels with current opponents to science-based actions in the Southern Ocean. And uh, uh, the US experience, uh, as also the commissioner said, uh, from 2016, when the CAMLAR members agreed to designate uh, the Ross Sea as the world's largest uh, marine protected area at that time, is invaluable. And uh, as, uh, as is also the US diplomatic power, as we want to keep this constructive and cooperative approach of CAMLAR. Uh, and the science is clear. Um, marine protected areas are vital to protecting biodiversity, to rebuild marine life and increase resilience to climate change. 
and by protecting at least 30% of the ocean with a network of sanctuaries, marine ecosystems can build resilience to better withstand rapid climate change. And we really welcome the Biden administration's commitment to protect 30% of US land and ocean. This is an ambitious target and Sweden supports also a call uh, for a global target of 30% of the planet's ocean to be protected by 2030. And we would certainly welcome uh, the US among the champions uh, of this broader call. And if uh, adopted, the three current proposals mentioned here for marine protection in Antarctica, the, the Verde Sea, the East Antarctica and the Antarctic Peninsula, Peninsula would be a, a substantial contribution towards this goal and also to achieve SDG 14.5 to protect 10% of the ocean. Uh, both the Southern Ocean as well as areas uh, beyond national jurisdiction will have, uh, uh, will have to contribute uh, to fulfill the 30% uh, target by 2030. And Sweden also as part of the European Union is dedicated to an ambitious and efficient BBNJ implementing agreement to enable uh, to meet this uh, target. Sweden has carried out research in Antarctica for more than 100 years now, often together with uh, uh, and in cooperation with the United States. We have been active member of the ATCM and CAMLAR since 1984. And we look forward to uh, continue close and constructive cooperation with American researchers and the Biden administration to um, promote uh, and, and further uh, constructive collaboration in Antarctica. Thanks. Ambassador Algren, thank you so much for your comments. Uh, thank you for focusing on the important role of, of science and science cooperation uh, in the context of Antarctica and of also referring to uh, restoring uh, the spirit of uh, constructive cooperation, which I'm sure we'll get back to in, in our discussion. So thank you very much indeed. Um, now I would like to turn to Dr. Enrique Sala, uh, who is Explorer in Residence at National Geographic. He founded and leads Pristine Seas, a project that combines exploration, research, and media to inspire country leaders to protect the last wild places in the ocean. Uh, to date, Pristine Seas has helped to create 23 of the largest marine reserves on the planet, covering an area of 6.5 million square kilometers. Enrique, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for having me, Evan. Um, thank you for organizing this um, discussion about Antarctica. And Commissioner Sinkevich uh, talked about the need to protect 30% of the ocean as a minimum by 2030. And there are two types of areas we should focus on. One is the wild near pristine areas that are still functioning and they look like the ocean of the past, but also they can serve as a blueprint for what the ocean of the future could be. And we need to save these places before it's too late. But also we have areas that contain unique and irreplaceable marine life biodiversity that is threatened by human activities that can be abated by protected areas. Antarctica has both, the Southern Ocean has both uh, types of areas. And three weeks ago, we published our latest research in the scientific journal Nature, identifying areas that are of the second type. What are areas that con contain biodiversity that is unique and not found anywhere else that is threatened? But that if protected, fully protected from extractive and damaging activities like mining, drilling, or fishing, would come back and would provide the greatest benefits from biodiversity. And most of these areas that we found are within the 200 miles exclusive economic zones of countries, because this is where most of the biodiversity and most of the threats are. And only a few areas stood out in the high seas. And one of those areas was the Antarctic Peninsula, actually. The Antarctic Peninsula has spots that are within the 5% top biodiversity priorities globally. And we know this, this area 
because in last year, before the lockdown, we were able to conduct an expedition, a uh, National Geographic Pristine Seas expedition to the Antarctic Peninsula to fill science gaps and produce a documentary that we premiered virtually last year in support of Chile's and Argentina's proposal for, for that system of MPAs in the Antarctic Peninsula and the domain one, the region. And we were able to partner with uh, both government, Chile and Argentina, and actually Chile was kind enough to provide a, a Navy vessel to be able to, to conduct the expedition. And like uh, was said before, you know, we need to protect an entire ecosystem here. This is not about individual species. And the Southern Ocean is one of the most productive places on earth. It is important for the climate, but also it's important for the productivity of the entire ocean. And one of the, well, the main fishery in that area is for krill. And krill is fish for omega-3s, but the krill don't make the omega-3s, they get it from algae. So there is a way to obtain the omega-3s that some people will need from cultures of microalgae in a lab. We don't need to extract all these tons of krill from Antarctica for this. But the krill is absolutely essential for the entire ecosystem because it's at the base of the food web. It's the food for penguins, for seals, for seabirds, for the large whales. And whales, we know that whales help to fertilize the Southern Ocean because when they ingest the krill, they excrete, they release a lot of the iron in their tissues, which helps to fertilize that part of the ocean which creates these blooms of, of microscopic algae, of plankton, that absorb a lot of CO2 from the atmosphere and help to mitigate climate change, but also feed the krill, which keeps that giant food web going on. So having the krill in the water means that not only we support the entire ecosystem, but we enhance, we foster the productivity of the system and also help to mitigate climate change. Unfortunately, in most areas in Antarctica, the krill populations have been reduced by 30 to 80 percent, which is a combination of global warming plus uh, fishing. And even Norwegian krill fishing companies support marine protected areas in the Antarctic Peninsula. And we have um, enough science knowing what areas have to be protected. So uh, like um, commissioners in Kevich made very clear, what we need basically is China and Russia to agree. Now, why hasn't it happened yet? There are uh, three main reasons. One is the typical excuse, more research is needed. Yeah, of course, you know, it would be great to have more research, but we have enough research to know what needs to be done and what the problem is. And research is a great tool, but also is one of the best excuses for delaying action. Right? The, the easiest way to delay action is to um, focus on a few aspects of the last scientific report and uh, you know, have problems with that and ask for more information, right? And that delays the process one more year. So that's number one. More research is not needed to know what we need to do, what we need to protect. The second one is the argument of food security. Oh, we need to fish in, in Antarctica for, for global food security. That's a myth. Uh, we do know that the economic, the net economic benefit from fishing in Antarctica are very low, except for a few companies in Norway and, and maybe France, you know, the, some of the countries that oppose are probably um, spent losing money there because not only the, prof, the revenue is very small, but also the costs are so high that they have to be subsidized by governments. And we published a, a study a couple of years ago on the, benefit, on the economics of fishing in the high seas and found that half of the fishing in the high seas, including the Southern Ocean, would not be profitable without government subsidies and also the high seas provide less than four percent of the global seafood catch and most of those species that are caught are high scale items for rich for food secure countries so fishing around antarctica fishing in the high seas is not essential for global food security and the final reason why is geopolitical reasons as you all <laughs> know very well antarctica is used um as a as a square in the global geopolitical chess game. Uh, so in my opinion, uh, the priorities for the Biden administration should be to engage in high level diplomacy with the governments of China and Russia, like the commissioner has said. The US has to show leadership and real interest. And it has to show also a spirit of cooperation without engagement of the Biden administration at the highest level, 
it's going to be very difficult to implement that vision that is so strongly supported by science. Thanks. Enrique, thank you uh, so much uh, for that and uh, ending with some important geopolitical reasons, which I'm sure the Biden administration officials will want to take uh, into account. Um, as the commissioner suggested, um, uh, at the time of the Ross Sea negotiations, um, there was a, a, a big high level focus. And um, as you suggest, um, that may be necessary uh, again. Um, so now let me uh, turn the floor over to uh, Dr. Sylvia Earle. Uh, she is president and chairman of uh, Mission Blue, the Sylvia Earle Alliance. Um, she is simply one of the most famous American explorers and scientists and one of the world's great leaders on marine conservation. And it is a, a great honor to have you with us. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Earl, please. Thank you for the opportunity to be a part of this discussion. And I want to really endorse my fellow explorer in residence, National Geographic, Enrique Sala, and his comments about a, a way forward looking at what we have achieved thus far with respect to understanding a part of the world that has only come to the attention of humans in the last couple of hundred years, which is rather remarkable when you think that how much we have learned in the last 200 years about the world generally, but especially about Antarctica. At the same time, in just two centuries, I think it's safe to say that we've lost more, especially in the last half century, as our capacity to access and to really impact, to have a, an influence on a part of the world that we did not even know existed for most of the existence of humankind. So I, to frame my remarks uh, and to convey the distillation of the conference of last week when we had a number of scientists get together and deliberate about what, what should we do? What could we offer to the new administration in the US? Uh, some thoughts that would be useful. I want to quote a science fiction writer who, in this case, articulated a remarkable science fact. That's Isaac Asimov, who said, science gathers knowledge faster than society gathers wisdom. We, as Enrique said, we know what to do. We've got the evidence, the science that we already have is clear. <laughs> I almost want to say we should learn about the biogeochemistry of the planet starting at a very early age. Follow the carbon, follow the carbon cycle. What is driving climate change? Follow the carbon. Emissions into the atmosphere, warming the planet, driving acidification of the ocean. But it's also carbon capture. It's a phytoplankton in Antarctica taking up carbon, providing the food that contains carbon that powers not just themselves, the krill, or the, the phytoplankton, but goes to the krill and drives the whole Antarctic ecosystem. But more than that, the cold water nutrient rich conveyed around the world in the deep sea that pops up through upwelling off the coast of Chile, off the coast of South Africa. You know, that, that view of earth that we now have, that children have, and even global leader, leaders have, that we are all connected. In some ways, the ocean divides people of the world, but mostly now we know the ocean connects all of us. And a center driver of those ocean connections 
is a topic of what we're discussing here now, Antarctica. But it isn't just the water and the rocks and the ice. It's life in Antarctic waters that is crucial, not just for the creatures on the land in Antarctica, but the creatures of the sea and life, including our lives, very much included. So to give you a little bit of the distillation of the conference last week, there were some rather nerdy terms that were being used, such as global relevance and influence, climate change to physical and biological feedbacks in the Southern Ocean that modify the global level processes and drive changes in marine and global climate systems. The state of Antarctica influences the world in so many ways. Now we know the science, the evidence is clear. Society has yet to catch up with policy and the way that people generally understand the importance of, let's say, polar regions, not just Antarctica, the, the cold sections that drive the rest of the world. Process-oriented awareness, well, another nerdy term, but it just means that climate change is shifting marine processes like the carbon cycle, primary productivity, the flow of life in the sea, government support and capacity building, policymakers, that would be, you know, the world leaders must increase high level support to maintain Antarctica as a model for multilateral governance. Everyone has a stake in what happens to Antarctica. It's not just a single country that has influence. It's the high seas in a way, but concentrated in the Southern Ocean. Knowing that we must collaborate in order to make decisions really, I think, brings into focus the importance of Antarctica to all of us everywhere. The concern about utilization of the word is the living resources, I suppose, to recognize that there, there is no indigenous taking of wildlife in the Southern Ocean, unless you account the whales and the seals and the seabirds, they are indigenous, not just decades or centuries, but over literally millions of years that have shaped not just the Southern Ocean, but have had a magnified influence on the state of the world, land and sea. It's part of, it's like an engine in the Southern part of the planet that is driving much of what is happening elsewhere on the planet. So we can talk about individual interests of various countries that are vested in Antarctica, but it really is important that we think globally and act knowing that while one country or another may think they have a special interest in taking from Antarctica, they're taking from all of us when they do. It's not just from a single country's interest. Climate-centric management is another output from our panel. To build resilience, the idea of having special protected areas and getting Camelar to really get serious about using the power that they have. But here's the thing. Protecting Antarctica, the waters of Antarctica, from what? From whom? What interests are, are really active? It's mostly the prospect of future mining and the current mining of life. And when you ask, so who needs to take the life from Antarctica? I think Enrique addressed the issue very directly. There is no food security justification. There's no economic justification if you take away the subsidies. So why are we doing it? You know, it's, the science is clear. 
the, the wisdom about how do we act on the science. This, the leaders need to understand. It's not just society. The leaders must lead on what we now know, that we have a chance to take action. Climate scientists say we have 10 years to really significantly do what it takes to go from planetary decline to leveling so that by 2030, we are on our way. We don't wait till 2030 to take action. We have to take action now so that in the next 10 years, we can achieve this, this greater harmony with nature and recovery and have sustained relationship with the natural systems that maintain our existence. So I heard President Sebastian Piñera on a trip to Antarctica to the Chilean station in 2019 that this is the first time that we understand the magnitude of the problems we face. It may be the last time we have to take action to address them. Things are moving very fast. Learned more in the past 200 years than during all preceding history. No, probably in the last 50 years, we've learned more than during all preceding history about the big questions that now face us. But we don't have 50 years to wait to act on that knowledge. And the headline is climate change. The headline is carbon, the carbon cycle. And what we have a chance now as never before, and maybe as never again, to ask not just the current Biden administration, but to look to the world and say, this is our moment to secure for just the, the best chance we will ever have armed with knowledge to take action that will secure an enduring place for us within the natural carbon-based systems that sustain us. Thank you. Dr. Earl, thank you uh, very much indeed uh, for your comments, um, for focusing on the rationale for marine protected areas uh, and uh, also for summarizing uh, some of the results from last week's workshop. Uh, greatly appreciate that. So now we have uh, an opportunity for some questions and answers. Uh, there have been some questions that have been uh, coming in. Um, I wonder if uh, I could start with more or less a political question and a number uh, of our panelists focused on this uh, question of how does, um, how do marine protected areas move forward um, in, in, without uh, get over the barriers, the political barriers the of our panelists focused on this uh, question of how does, um, how do marine protected areas move forward um, in, in, without uh, get over the barriers, the political I'm barriers? Hearing my voice again. Are you Our hearing my voice again? On this uh, question of. Okay. Well, I'm going to try that again. Um, the barriers, the political barriers. Hearing my voice again. Are you hearing my voice again? <laughs> okay. Um, as, as, as our panelists know well, um, the Commission for the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources operates on the basis of consensus, which means that you have to have all of the countries who are members agree. And so we've reached a point where um, two countries in particular, Russia and China, have uh, indicated uh, their, their uh, uh, problems with moving ahead with some of these MPAs. So I wonder if we could go uh, to that question a little bit and see um, whether uh, we could go into a little bit more detail about 
um, what needs to be done both by the uh, US and others in order to move forward. We've had some very helpful suggestions about the need to act at, at high levels. Um, the EU uh, is holding a meeting April 28th at high level to try to mobilize some support, I believe, and it'd be interesting to hear more about that. So um, I'd welcome comments on um, how to get everybody on board in order to have MPAs. So who would like to go first? Well, let me dive in. Please, thank you. If I could. <laughs> we have, we as humans inherited a planet that was intact and it works in our favor. During the history of humankind, we have consumed the natural systems that have fostered our prosperity. We did not know until fairly recently that there were limits to what we could extract and still have a planet that functions in our favor. We have literally been degrading the very elements that make our existence possible. So it's common sense when you do think about it, it when you have the capacity to do what we now can do to pull back and look how the world functions as a whole. What keeps us alive in a universe that is really unfriendly? And now we know, we can see it. It's the diversity of life, the fabric of life. It's a living system. It's a miracle in a way. If we didn't know, it would be one thing. I mean, there are a lot of smart creatures on the planet that don't know. Whales are smart, elephants are smart. Humans have the capacity to learn from the past and apply it to the present and map a future. And here we are, we're at a critical stage. So protected areas, it's like putting band-aids on the problem, but the real problem is respect for the natural systems that really maintain the integrity of a planet that works in our favor. So we've seen progress, but we really need to hurry. Literally the next 10 years will make all the difference. And from where we have been a hundred years ago, 50 years ago, the start of the 20th century, and now we're making modest progress toward protecting this web of, of life that keeps us alive. The more we can do to invest in protecting the natural systems that make the framework of Earth exceptional in the universe. Well, you know, it's easy to forget when you're just living your everyday life, but we have the capacity as never before right now to see what is happening, driving climate change, driving the, the, the collapse of our life support systems, if you will. So why do we need protected areas? <laughs> because it protects us. Thank you very much. Uh, Commissioner Sincarges, do, do you want to speak uh, to any of the political issues, how you're going to manage um, some of the opposition within, within Camelot to move at least the EU MPA proposals forward? Thank you. Uh, I mean, I, I wasn't... Uh... Uh, getting in uh, too much uh, involved into this, as as I thought I, I've covered this uh, during uh, during uh, my intervention, because I think the most important is, of course, remains um, to answer question to 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 ourselves: Is it a top priority in our political agenda? And if it's a top priority, then it has to be uh, dealt at the highest level. And then I think, uh, of course, uh, many doors uh, can open, uh, many ears can can hear and and receive information, and of course we we we, we might manage to 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 get to an agreement. I think a a, a great job already has been done uh, by the scientist community, uh, by the diplomatic corps, and I think now it's it's time for a, a push at at the highest political level to ensure uh, that uh, the agreement is found. Uh, I think US can play a crucial role as we have a experience with the Ross Sea. Uh, so joining the EU's proposal as a co-sponsors uh, definitely uh, would uh, make it uh, stronger. 
Thank you very much. Um, if there are no uh, further, oh, Helen, please. Well, um, um, I think that um, there are many things that we disagree about. Uh, if you look at uh, the EU, uh, US, Russia and China, and um, uh, that's uh, uh, difficult to say anything against. But I think we need to, when it comes to stewardship of our joint, our common home, we need to foster uh, a spirit of, of uh, global cooperation. And that is through both um, uh, high level leadership at the highest priority and possible level, but also in uh, trying to uh, stimulate and, and uh, foster more understanding and connections between scientific communities in, in different countries, but also between peoples. So um, we have to work on many fronts uh, at different levels. Um, and uh, we have mentioned a couple of, of meetings from the highest level to bracing the issue uh, on, um, for example, the US climate summit and in G7 and G20 meetings and whatever, whenever global leaders are meeting, but also to try to have uh, an open mind and understand where, where each and, and every one of us are coming from and, and trying to get into each other's uh, shoes, so to say, and uh, create a more um, um, a listening mode and, and uh, uh, spirits of, of partnership of our common home. Thank you very much. Enrique? If I can say something quick, I, I'd like to um, re-emphasize what the commissioner said. Um, you know, China and Russia showed tremendous global leadership a few years ago when they joined with over 20 countries in the European Union to protect the raw sea, to create the largest protected area, land and sea. And uh, Russia has a special role here because 200 years ago, a Russian admiral discovered Antarctica. Russia has a long history in the scientific research and exploration of Antarctica. They have 12 stations, some year round, some seasonal. Russia showed this tremendous leadership um, in 2016 for, for the Ross Sea. You were part of those conversations. So you know, if they can do it again, right? um, the world needs Russia and China to show global leadership again. And of course, this year of COVID hasn't made it easy because there haven't been uh, meetings in person and, and not all parties want to do negotiations over, over Zoom. Uh, so this is why uh, the high level uh, engagement at this point is absolutely essential. And I think it's, it's the, 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 last, the, the, the last straw to make this happen. Sorry. Thank you very much, Enrique. Um, I wonder if I could segue to a point that you uh, were making and others were making, and that is the relationship between Antarctica to global targets. Um, and that's something which uh, your recent, your and your colleagues' recent paper in Nature uh, points out um, the importance of 30 by 30 and other uh, international initiatives. Um, I wonder if uh, any of you would have that, um, have some thoughts about uh, the connection, the importance of, of the Southern Ocean in, in relation to that global effort. Enrique, do you wanna start with that? Sure, and it's actually quite simple because when we think about, if we have to protect a representative sample of ecosystems on earth, everybody would think, of course, no, we need to protect tropical forest, we need to protect the taiga, the tundra, uh, deserts, boreal forest, temperate forest, you know, um, wetlands, um, peat box. But when it comes to the ocean, most people think, well, you know, it's just, it's just bull. But the diversity of ecosystems is the ocean, in the ocean is as high as on the land. 
So when we think about what are these ocean ecosystems, these pieces of ocean that contain assemblages of species, ecosystems that are absolutely unique and different from the rest of the world, Antarctica has so many of them, right? Because Antarctica is so isolated in some way from the rest of, of the planet. There is this, this current that goes around Antarctica all year round that provides some isolation on the surface while sending deep water, as, as Sylvia mentioned. So those ecosystems in Antarctica contain assemblages of species, contain biodiversity that is absolutely unique and irreplaceable. And if we protect these areas that are most threatened by human activities and the Antarctic Peninsula rises to the top, the benefits that we'll gain are going to be the highest. So that's why, um, you know, it doesn't matter how you look at it, all analysis point to the need to protect the, the key places in Antarctica if we are to protect the functioning of the ocean, if we are going to enhance the resilience of the ocean to climate change and also make sure that vital places all around the world are, are preserved. Thank you very much. Dr. Earl. Adding to, to that is recognition that while the Southern Ocean is isolated by the circumpolar current and it, it does connect in the deep sea to the rest of the world, including to the Arctic. The polar areas have a magnified impact on shaping the way the world functions in our favor. Uh, we know enough about the past to know that when polar systems melt, there's a very different planet, not really, not really favorable to life as we know it. Cycles come and cycles go over a long period of time, but our influence on shaping what's happening to the polar areas right now is measurable. We can see it. And because we know what the problems are, doing everything we can to stabilize the issues that are driving the melting of ice and the destruction of diversity of life, ecosystem by ecosystem, species by species, we're, we're shredding our life support system. And one thing that does require additional research is going deep and it's global, but recently the discoveries in the deep ecosystems in Antarctica, coral reef systems, not like you see in, in the South Pacific, but in deep water systems around the world, sponges, corals, diversity of life that is comparable to what you see in shallow coral reef systems, those two, are at risk right now as the planet warms. So putting all of it together, it just magnifies the importance of actions to be taken now while we still have a chance, the precautionary principle, but it's more than that. We, we know what to do. It's not a matter of precaution. It's like, we are in trouble. Here's a recipe for stabilizing the way the world functions protected areas. It just makes sense that you do everything you can to hold your life support system intact. Thank you very much. We have others who want to speak to that. Helen, did you? Well, um, uh, maybe I could also um, add uh, something with, um, I mean, we are, we are uh, discussing uh, uh, the new uh, MPAs that we need to agree on uh, and take decision upon, uh, but we uh, also need to um, uh, cooperate closer on, on uh, climate change and update um, the science we have there. And for example, the EU has an initiative to update the climate resolution from 2009 
and uh, that would be uh, great to get support by others to uh, to update it from the current what we know currently uh, of the um, science based and uh, um, and also when it comes to marine debris for example uh, with when we see increased activities in the Antarctica and also with tourism and fishing, uh, this is an issue we need to um, uh, to work with. And um, uh, Sweden and, and US have been active in in um, the Arctic Council and uh, developing a marine litter action plan. So maybe that. There are some good experience that we could use uh, also uh, in Antarctica. Uh, and also when it comes to uh, IUU fishing, uh, we might want to see uh, um, more cooperation with neighboring RFMOs to strengthen the monitoring and control uh, of transshipment operations and so on. So there are several areas also where we need to strengthen uh, our work um, um, uh, together with the MPA decisions. Thank you. That that's um, those are very good points, and I wonder, I, picking up on one of them in relation to tourism. So, um, of course, with the pandemic, um, the tourism has, uh, especially shipboard tour tourism, has gone down uh, significantly. Um, but it's predicted that that will go back up again. Um, do any of the pan panelists have any thoughts on um, the environmental uh, issues that are raised by tourism as it ramps up in future years in Antarctica? Absolutely. I think it has to be con uh, strictly controlled because we have seen this pattern all over the world. You know, National Geographic uh, Traveler made a, a survey every number of years uh, ranking the top tourist destinations on the planet and you know the top 20 are places like Antarctica or the New Zealand fjords or Norwegian fjords or Patagonia areas with wild spaces because people have a craving especially after the pandemic for natural spaces outside from cities and and the built environment and we have seen places that were absolute paradises become absolutely overrun by bad tourism and become something normal and mediocre. So we need to be very careful about the last wild places left, not just uh, in Antarctica, but around the world. But Antarctica is especially fragile environment because like Sylvia mentioned, there's never been human habitation there. So that those ecosystems have evolved without us. So we need to make, be very, very careful and make sure that the, the post pandemic craving for wild spaces is not going to damage those ecosystems. Thank you. Sylvia? <laughs> the key is responsible tourism as a, as a means of educating and celebrating why these places, the wild places, with a focus on polar regions, why they matter. Um, pictures, they say, are worth a thousand words. An experience has to be worth a thousand pictures. Every decision maker who is, is uh, making policy about Antarctica should go to Antarctica and experience what it's like and to, to, to see what their, the consequences of their decisions will have. It's, it's a small thing, but it's an important thing to expose people in a way that is meaningful to why they should care and not to stop there, but to become magnifiers, to use their experiences to convey support for why we, why we must take care going forward and not lose the chance that we now have. But the, the biggest problem, I think, is not tourism in terms of the ships that go there. They're the ships that go to take and extract and bring things that they leave behind, the fishing nets and trawls and things that are left in Antarctic waters and continue as, as they do elsewhere in the world. It's not just the illegal 
in unreported and unregulated fishing. It's the legal fishing, the industrial scale fishing that is now permitted in Antarctic waters that we should really be addressing as the primary issue affecting many aspects of, of, of the concerns, whether it's diversity loss, the carbon cycle, um, you know, it's food security for the penguins and whales. It's not food security for humans that are, is, is really on the, in the spotlight right now. Thank you very much. We, we have just uh, about a minute and a half left. I thought I'd go back to uh, Commissioner Sincarajus for uh, one last perhaps thought on uh, sustainable fishing. Uh, you uh, run an organization that focuses on, on fishing. I wonder if you have any thoughts on that. Thank you very much. Uh, I think it's absolutely crucial uh, first of all to 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 reach uh, to 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 have an agreement at the uh, double uh, WTO level on uh, harmful fishery subsidies uh, is one and and and, uh, and secondly of course i think uh, maintaining a sustainable fisheries uh, not only within the EU, but 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 uh, across the globe. Uh, especially, we 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 touched upon uh, today a lot on Antarctica and MPA. But one important negotiations are ongoing. Uh, well, what, when we speak about the the high seas and so-called BB and J agreement, uh, which is again, uh, if you look uh, countries which are not supporting you, you would find a very very similar list. And, and I think uh, that's also extremely crucial to make sure that uh, we not only fish uh, sustainably, responsibly in our own waters, but also uh, in the high seas. And uh, I, I truly believe that with additional push, we can uh, reach uh, an important uh, agreement on the high seas also this year. And that would be a, a, a great achievement, of course. Later on comes an important part of monitoring and implementing, uh, making sure that it's it's implemented. But an agreement would be uh, an uh, an important push forward. Thank you very much. I want to thank all of the panelists. Uh, I'd like to turn the uh, floor back to the uh, director of the Polar Institute, Mike Sprega, for a final final thought. Mike. <clears throat> Thank, thank you, Evan, and thank you for your leadership, not just on this panel, but also uh, work, working with all of us at the Polar Institute to craft and inform our Antarctic programming going forward and our scholarship going forward. I want to thank the 600 plus uh, colleagues who have registered today for, for this discussion that tells us something about the importance of this issue. I want to thank this outstanding panel of experts for bringing important perspective to not just this program, but I have been feverishly writing notes uh, and many of the issues you have brought up today will undoubtedly be topics that we explore going forward. I also want to thank Senator Whitehouse for his comments and Ambassador Mark Green for opening the program with his keynote uh, uh, comments. And also our Latin America program, Chile, Argentina, and other countries were mentioned, our Latin America program and our Global Europe program for their support. Uh, and I want to thank the team back in Washington, D.C., not just at 1300 Pennsylvania Avenue, but at their home studios for making today possible. That's Tracy Fitzgerald and Jared Thompson. They simply make our programs go, especially over this past year. And Michaela Stith, our program assistant at the Polar Institute, for all of her work. So colleagues and friends, thank you so much for spending this time with us. And thank these panel panelists, uh, these experts for providing their expertise and guidance, Evan, for your leadership and insight. And we will look forward to hosting yet more of these discussions into the future. Thank you all once again for being a part of the Polar Institute's program today on the Antarctic. Thank you very much.